In this video, I'd like to talk about the four ways that we are going to determine an enthalpy change for a chemical reaction. In previous videos, we've just given you the enthalpy change. Remember, enthalpy change is delta H. And we just gave you the delta H, for example, when we did the stoichiometry of heat calculation. But suppose you don't have that value. And suppose you need it in order to do some other calculation. Well, there are four common methods of determining an enthalpy change for a chemical reaction. So I'm going to list these four key methods, and then we'll go through each one in turn with examples of how each of these methods is used. The first method is called calorimetry. C-A-L-O-R-I-M-E-T-R-Y, calorimetry. The second is called Hess's Law. And I like to specify that it's stepwise Hess's Law so that we can remember one of the fundamental aspects of Hess's Law is that it talks about uh, calculating things in steps. So stepwise Hess's Law. A third method is using standard enthalpies of formation. And I'm going to use a notation here that I want you to pay attention to. Delta H, that's the change in enthalpy. And I'm going to put a little, a little what's called a naught sign. It looks like a degree sign. Delta H naught. And then a subscript with a lowercase f. That's delta H naught sub f. And this is the standard enthalpy of formation. Delta H naught sub f. And we'll go over this more later. And the fourth method that we use to determine an enthalpy change for a reaction is using bond enthalpies. Also called bond dissociation energies. So bond enthalpies or bond dissociation energies. So those are the four key ways that we can determine a delta H, an enthalpy change, for a chemical reaction. Now, how do we know which of these methods we're going to use? Which method is the best method to use for a particular problem? We have to look at the problem, and it's the information that you are given in the problem will dictate which of these methods that you use to solve for an enthalpy change. All right. With that in mind, we're going to deal with the very first of these methods called calorimetry. So calorimetry. Okay, so the first of these methods is calorimetry. And in order to be able to do calorimetry, we first need to work with heat energy, Q. And to be able to measure heat energy, we need units of measurement to measure heat energy in. So to measure units of heat energy, or Q, I've given you a long blank for that, but that's, uh, that's just Q, heat energy. We generally use two different units of measurement. And the first is the calorie, C-A-L-O-R-I-E, the calorie. And the other is the joule. We've seen the joule before and its derivation, the kilojoule. So the two units of measurement that we can use to measure heat energy are calories and joules. So let's talk about the calorie first. The calorie is defined as the amount of heat energy required to Heat one gram of water by one degree 
Celsius. So, how much heat energy is required to raise a gram of water 1 degree Celsius in temperature? Say from 15 degrees Celsius to 16 degrees Celsius? Well, that heat energy required to do that is defined as a calorie. Well, if that's what a calorie is, what is a joule? And we've talked about a joule being the amount of energy required to move a certain mass over a certain distance in a certain time, but we can also write it in terms of calories. So one calorie is 4.184 joules. A calorie is 4.184 joules. So take a moment. Does this mean that a calorie is larger than a joule or a joule is larger than a calorie? Well, obviously a calorie is a larger unit of measurement because it takes 4.184 joules to equal a calorie. So a calorie is more heat energy than a joule would be. Now this amount of heat one calorie, or 4.184 joules, that amount of heat is called the specific heat. Of water. Specifically of water. What do we mean by specific heat? It is the amount of energy required to raise one gram of that water specifically of water, exactly one degree Celsius, right? So if we want to know the specific heat of water, the amount of energy required to raise one gram of water, one degree Celsius, this is the specific heat of water. It's one calorie or it's 4.184 joules. This is very important. We are going to use this value again and again. All right, and I want to emphasize that this number is only for water. Other substances have different specific heats. They require different amounts of energy to raise a gram of them one degree Celsius. But this value is the specific heat for water. So with this in mind, we can write a more encompassing equation to say that the amount of heat Q required to change the temperature of any sample of water is therefore given in this equation. Q, that's the heat required, equals the mass of the water that we're trying to heat times the specific heat of water times the change in temperature that we are trying to achieve. Okay, so if we're trying to find out how many uh, joules or calories of heat is required to heat up some water, then we have the mass of the water, and this is going to be in grams. The specific heat of water, which is if we're using joules, it would be 4.184 joules of heat per gram degree Celsius. And this delta T would then be in degrees Celsius. So let's say, for example, I wanted to heat up 50 milliliters of water, and the 50 milliliters of water weighed 50 grams, so it would be 50 grams. And I wanted to heat it up from 22 degrees Celsius to 27 degrees Celsius. The delta T would be 3 degrees Celsius change. I would take the 50 grams times the 4.184 joules per gram degree Celsius times the 3 degrees Celsius. I'm trying to change it. And I could get the heat required to do that in joules if I use that value. This equation right here, Q equals mass times specific heat times delta T. This is known as the calorimetry equation. 
And I'd like to point out the units here. The units of measurement. Because the specific heat of water is given in joules per grams or per degree Celsius, that means the mass has to be in grams and the temperature change is in degree Celsius. All right, so Q equals mass of the liquid or sa other sample that we're trying to heat up times the specific heat of the sample, which if it's water, then it's that number. But if it's some other substance, it would be a different number times the change in temperature that we're trying to achieve. That's the calorimetry equation. So we're going to use it. We're going to use this calorimetry equation to answer this question. So sample problem A, how many joules, joules is an energy, are required to raise the temperature of 12 grams of water from this temperature to boiling temperature? So notice what they've given me. They're asking me for joules of energy, so they're asking me for Q. And they're saying I'm going to raise the temperature, so I'm going to have, I'm going to heat up 12 grams, and there's my mass, of water. And so I know what the specific heat of water is. Specific heat of water equals 4.184 joules per gram degree Celsius. Okay. And then they give me an initial temperature. There's a T1 initial temperature and a final temperature, T2 to the boiling temperature. So with that in mind, and with the way that I've assigned some values here, I would like for you to pause the video and answer, see if you can work out this problem, sample problem A, and then go on to sample problem B and see if you can answer that one as well. And when you're done working on both of those problems, restart the video and come back and I will, I will work through them with you. Okay, coming back from pausing the video, let's see how we're going to do this. So they're asking for joules, that's an energy, are required to raise the temperature. So it's heat energy that's, that's going to have to be put into this to make a temperature increase. They're giving me the mass of the water that I'm trying to change in temperature. They're telling me the substance, so I have to know that, that there is a specific heat for that substance, and I have to know what it is. Then they're giving me the initial temperature and the final temperature. So I'm going to plug it in to my calorimetry equation. Q equals mass times specific heat times delta T. There's the general form of my calorimetry equation. Now I'm going to start plugging in values. What is the mass? It's 12 grams. What is the specific heat? Well, it's water that we're trying to heat up. And I know the specific heat of water, 4.184 joules per gram per degree Celsius. And what is the delta T? Well, they haven't given me the delta T directly but they've given me a final and initial temperature. So I can calculate delta T. Let me do that right over here. Delta T equals T final minus T initial. Make sure I don't get these backward. There's my T initial, there's my T final. So that final goes there, the initial goes there. And so I have 100.0 degrees Celsius minus 22.0 degrees Celsius. And my answer is 78.0 degrees Celsius. There's my change in temperature. So there's my delta T. It's, is it increasing or decreasing? Well, I'm raising the temperature, so I'd better get a, an increase in temperature, right? So this delta should be a positive value because it's increasing. The change is a positive value. So it's 78.0 degrees Celsius. And there I have all my, my numbers plugged in. So the rest is just calculator work. And the answer that I get has to be rounded to two sig figs. So get that separated from that calculation. So my answer, the calculator gives me 3916.224 rounded to two sig figs. And that's going to be 3900, 
what units of measurement? Well, you can see that the grams cancel, the degrees Celsius cancel, and I'm left with joules. And that's great because that is exactly what I was asked for. How many joules? So what does this mean? There's my answer. Let me circle it. What does this mean? It means that if I have 12 grams of water and I want to increase that water's temperature by 78 degrees Celsius, then I'm, not, then I'm going to need to put this much heat energy into it. Is this an enthalpy? No, it's just Q. It's just a heat energy. Because I'm not running a chemical reaction, I'm just trying to change the temperature of a chemical substance. So that's why we refer to Q and not enthalpy in this problem. All right, this is a very important equation. It's called the calorimetry equation, and you will see it again. Let's take a look at the sample problem B. This is a conceptual question, just to make sure that we're tracking with the difference between endothermic and exothermic. So the question asks, is the evaporation of water an endothermic or exothermic process? Endothermic or exothermic process? And then why would you say so? So I add the word why here at the end so that you don't you can't just get away with answering, oh, it's endothermic, or oh, it's exothermic, and thinking you're done. I want to know that you know why you're answering one or the other. So that's why I put the why there. So let's think of what, about what's happening when we evaporate water. We have some liquid water, and I'll just represent it as a bowl of liquid water. And then we have water vapor that's evaporating off into the air around it. So it's that process that's going on. Evaporation it describes basically the same process as boiling. It's the conversion from the liquid to the gaseous state. If we intentionally put heat into this to make this physical change happen, we usually refer to it as boiling because we're forcing it to happen. But if we just leave it alone and let the ambient heat from the environment cause it to happen as a passive process, we generally refer to it as evaporating. But they both refer to the same process, a liquid turning into a gas. So, is this process an endothermic or exothermic process? Well, to answer that question, we need to think about endo and exo. Endothermic means heat is going into the system. Exothermic, heat is going out of the system. To get a liquid to evaporate, is it taking heat into the system in order to accomplish this? Or is it releasing heat from the system in order to accomplish this? Well, if we think of the analogous process of boiling, then it becomes really obvious. We're going to have to put heat into the system to get it to convert from a liquid to a gas. And that's what evaporating does, but it just takes heat from the ambient atmosphere around it to cause this to happen. But yes, heat is going into the system to cause it to happen. Q energy, heat energy, is going into the system to cause this to happen. And since Q is going into the system, it is an endothermic process. So to answer the question, it's an endothermic process. Why? Because the system has to absorb heat in order to accomplish this phase change. Okay? All right. Moving along. We talked about the specific heat of water and here I've got the specific heat of water right here on this little table for you. You can see that it's 4.184 joules per gram degree Celsius. But you can see that I've, I've got a, a, some other substances on here, and they don't have the same specific heat. In fact, every chemical, regardless of what it is, every chemical has its own unique specific heat, has its own
What does that mean? Every chemical requires a different amount of energy to raise one gram of it one degree Celsius in temperature. And we've got a number of different chemical substances here. We've got gold, a couple of different allotropes or forms of carbon. There's diamond and graphite forms, allotropes. A couple of other different metals, copper and iron, and then water. But again, I could list the specific heat for every chemical substance. They all have their own unique values. So here's a little quick question. Which takes more energy to heat up? The same amount of mass. So if I wanted to heat up the same amount of mass, metals or water, which would require more energy to do it? So if I look at the metals like gold and copper and iron here, gold takes about 0.129 joules to heat up a gram of gold, one degree Celsius. And there's the values for how much it takes to do the same for copper and iron. Compare that to water. And you notice that it takes a lot more energy to raise one gram of water, one degree Celsius, than it does for metals. And so for that reason, we say that water takes a more energy to heat per unit mass than metals do. And so we say that water has a relatively high specific heat among other substances. So, energetically speaking, it is more difficult to change the temperature of water than it is to change the temperature of other substances. It takes more energy to get water's temperature to change than it does to change the temperature of, say for example, copper wire. Well, we're going to use these specific heats and the calorimetry equation that we've used before only now we're going to use the process to determine the amount of heat energy required to heat up substances other than water. So keep in mind, we are not going to use the specific heat of water for these. We're going to use the specific heat of whatever chemical substance we're talking about. So I have a sample problem here for you. Sample problem is, how many joules of heat energy does it take to heat a 2.00 kilogram sample of gold from room temperature to its melting point. So a couple of things here. First of all, I don't know what you've been doing or why you have two, two kilograms of gold, but congratulations, well done. However you got a hold of it, that's, that's your business. But I'd like to point out to you that the mass here is given in kilograms and the specific heat of gold is in joules per gram degree Celsius. So what do you think you're going to have to do to this right here? Yeah, you're probably going to have to convert that to grams first. All right, go ahead and use the specific heat of gold up here and solve this problem, how many joules of heat energy are required. And when you're done, go ahead and restart the video and come back and uh, I will work through it. All right, coming back from pausing the video, we're going to uh, work through this problem. How many joules of heat energy does it take to heat a sample from a temperature to a temperature? So we know this is a, we're going to use our calorimetry equation. The general form of the calorimetry equation. So let's start to plug in values. The mass is 2.00 kilograms. I need to convert it to grams. So what is 2.00 kilograms in grams? There are 1,000 grams per one kilogram. So I should get 2,000 grams. Now I'll leave it that way, even though we know that there's three sig figs here. I'll leave it here for now, but I'm going to have to round my answer at the end to three sig figs. So 2,000 grams of gold. And again, congratulations uh, on coming by so much gold. Times the specific heat, not of water, because we're not heating up water, we're heating up gold, solid gold, which is now a different number for the specific heat. 0 0.129 joules per gram degree Celsius. 
Now you are expected to, to remember what the specific heat of water is. It's 4.184 joules per gram degree Celsius. You are expected to know that one. But the other specific heats of other chemicals, you are not expected to memorize those. They would be given to you in a problem on an exam, for example. So specific heat for gold is 0 0.129 joules per gram degree Celsius. So that's what we plugged in here. And now the delta T, the change in temperature. So we are going from 22.0 degrees Celsius to 1064. So remember delta T equals T final minus T initial. So T final is 1064 minus T initial, which is 22.0. And my calculator says 1064 minus 22.0 equals 1042. Do I go one more place past the decimal? No. This is addition subtraction. So I'm stuck at the ones column. And so that is degrees Celsius. That is the delta T, the change in temperature. Okay, so 1042 degrees Celsius. And now I have my numbers. The rest is calculator work. And my answer has to be rounded. Don't, don't be fooled by that. That was just a temporary number that came from there. There are only three sig figs there, right? There are three sig figs there. And there are four sig figs there. So we're going to round this to three sig figs. So my calculator tells me 268836. And so that'll be rounded to 269000 units in joules. Grams cancel, degrees Celsius cancel, leaves me with joules, and that's what I was asked for in my problem, and I'm done. That's a lot of energy required. 269,000 joules of energy would be required to heat a two kilogram sample of gold from room temperature just to get it up to its melting point. Now, it would take more energy to actually get it to melt, but this is getting its temperature up to the point where it can start melting. All right.